Good morning. It's Sunday, November 27th. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, my name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Sunday school class. I'm in the book of Exodus. We've been going through the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 17. Um, let me tell you, God's dealing with the people who don't know anything about it. Abraham had a personal relationship with God. Isaac had an okay relationship with God. Jacob had a relationship with God, where God spoke to him. But once they were disobedient and went to Egypt and stayed, going to Egypt wasn't the disobedient part, it was the staying part. Even though God had said, I've given you this land, you're in Canaan. They preferred the comfort of Egypt to God's promise. They stopped talking to God, they stop thinking about God. They're there for a couple hundred years, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. And um, what they've learned is the Egyptian ways. They've learned there's a God of each thing. Every five feet, there's a different God for a different thing. Um, and that that God just does what he wants and you can bring fruit or something into the temple to appeal to that God, but that God's just going to do whatever he wants. Um, God is now taking them out of that situation and he's teaching them that they can have a personal relationship with God. I don't know that we think much differently today. We just think if you, if either people just don't believe in a God or they think that there are a lot of little gods of uh, different things that just bring you luck. Uh, so my horoscope guides my day. I found a lucky penny. That means something. I, I rub the head of this little Buddha in my room and that means something. Everything means something. They don't we believe that there's one God controlling everything. If you do believe there's one God controlling everything, a lot of times we think that he's just simply watching from a distance. God is watching us from a distance. And so, um, uh, we think that he's just kind of seeing what we're doing and keeping tally and he, he kind of set the universe in motion and that he doesn't really care about our daily activities. That's kind of up to us. God helps those who helps themselves, which is not in the Bible, but we're supposed to just do our thing and God watches and then every so often he'll show up to, uh, say, uh, that was wrong, but but mostly he's just this. We believe he's this God that's inactive and just watching. He's trying to teach the, the Israelites who are coming out of Egypt. I'm a daily God. Talk to me daily. I'm actually involved in your life every day, every step that you take, every time that you. I prepared a way for you. If you can just recognize it, I've I've got a path that you should follow, that'll give you more success. And so, um, good morning, good morning. So, um, they have to learn that, and, and we have to learn that. We just don't live that way in general. I mean, as a society, you know, that talk to God every day. He actually, actually has a plan for that day for you. He's actually set things in motion that you can recognize. Um, in general, we just think, God helps those who helps himself. It's like up to us, just do what you can, just do your thing as much as you, and then if it gets really horrible, God will show up and stop you. But you're just on your own um, in general. And so God's trying to reteach them. He's trying to reestablish in their minds, I actually, that, that's the purpose of the manna. Even though he gave them the manna because he was frustrated, I want to teach you every day I'm going to supply your need. Jesus, when he came down, had to teach. The Beatitudes is about, let me reteach God, because you think now that God is this angry God, because the only time they recognized God is when he did show up and do some big thing as far as judgment was concerned. They didn't recognize God every day. They didn't go, oh, look what happened today. That was God directing me. That This job that I got that I thought, ah, I just got it. And, 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 
God got that for me, and there's something I'm supposed to learn in it until I move on to the next job. And since we don't think God's involved in our affairs, we complain the whole time we're at that job we don't like, instead of thinking, no, wait a minute, God got me this job that I don't like. So maybe there's something I'm supposed to learn. Maybe there's something he's teaching me. Maybe there's something I'm, he wants me to do. If we don't think God's involved in our everyday affairs, then we complain a lot because we just don't think God had anything to do with this or anything to do with that. We couldn't have had anything to do with that neighbor who's so rowdy next door. Maybe he did. Maybe he brought that neighbor next door. Maybe there's something you're supposed to learn about patience. Or maybe there's something you're supposed to give to that neighbor next door as far as helping them. You know, we just, we don't think God's involved in our everyday affairs. And so we don't interpret things as correctly. We could, we laugh at the people in the Bible. Oh, how, how could they not know that? But we, we, it's us. So God is teaching these Israelites how to pray. They, they, weren't, they didn't pray every day. That wasn't a thing. Uh, in fact, when God's talking to Moses, he says, tell them I'm Jehovah. I'm the, I'm the one that made all those promises. He says, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they didn't know me as Jehovah, the promise-keeping God. They knew me as Elohim, the God who kind of created the universe. But as far as the one who says, I'm going to do this and then I do it, they didn't know me that way because I made all these promises about this is your land. And the, these people get to see the fulfillment. You get, they get to see the promises kept. And they didn't know a God that keeps their promises. They just knew a God that might have created the universe and then flooded everybody out. And that's about it. He's just up there doing his thing and we're down here doing our thing. And God's like, nope. If you're my people, I actually have cut out an actual plan for your life. And your life will be more successful. Things will go better if you are actually able to recognize the signs and obey them and consult me and, and I will talk to you and I will lead you and I'll be the lamp when you're in the darkness that guides you where to go. I'll be the door you can go through so you know which way to go. I'm going to be all those things. And so he's trying to teach them and conversely he's teaching us uh, also to have this everyday sort of thing happening in our lives. So um, they're learning who God is, just like baby Christians learning, oh, you mean God will help in that situation? Yes. You mean God even cares about this? Yes. So I want to back up. I'm into Exodus chapter 17. I want to back up a tiny bit to the last week's lesson and just point out a couple things. Uh, they got to, when after they crossed the Red Sea and God did this miracle, they went for three days and then came to a place where there was bitter water. So they had stopped at each place, hadn't found water, hadn't found water. When they finally found water, it was bitter. That's on purpose. God led them to the bitter water to say, I can make the bitter water sweet. Led them there to teach them. See, when you come into these situations, don't freak out. Don't go crazy. I can make the bitter water in your life sweet. So just consult me when you come to these situations. Don't get depressed. Don't give up. Oh, no. Look how terrible it is. I know that. I actually led you to that. I can make the bitter water sweet. Then they go a few days and they're complaining about the food. That's when he supplies them with man in the morning, quail at night, um, so he can teach them. Also, I'm, I'm actually concerned about your food every day. Don't worry about it. I know that you need food every day. I have a plan. Just because you don't immediately see it doesn't mean that I don't have something in operation. And you can walk into a house and all the lights are out, and, but the electricity is there waiting for you to plug stuff in or... Flick this switch. It's already wired. It's already been somebody came in before you and fixed everything. And, you know, it's a new home. And you just click this or push that. Oh, look, somebody. And and so even though we don't see it when we first come in, oh, it looks dark. God's like, nope, I've already got it all wired. So uh, he's trying to teach them don't go by sight, but by faith that I've, you know, I've got a plan. I got here before you. I got it worked out. Then they came to a place where there was supposed to have been water. So again, there's three different situations in. You come to the water and it's bitter. I can make it sweet. You come to a place where there's nothing and it's like, uh, don't worry, I, I've come here before you. I've got provision for you. Then they came to a place where they're expecting water. So sometimes in our life, 
we already know, oh, well, I know on Friday my tech's going to show up, or I know on Saturday so and so is going to get here and they're going to help me with this. And when that doesn't happen, we get really frustrated because we have plotted out in our heads how everything's supposed to work out. The person's going to do this, and then that's going to happen, and then this is going to show up. And when those things don't happen, our plan gets thwarted, and we just go, oh, oh. And God's like, don't worry. I knew your plan was going to get thwarted, and my plan didn't get thwarted. So, so they get to this place, Rephadim, which is called the resting place, where everybody stops. There's always palm trees and oasis, always. And they get there, and the water's dried up. And that's when he has them strike the rock. Moses, I want you to strike the rock and show you as long as there's a rock there, I can bring water from the rock. So not only can I turn the bitter water sweet, but when you don't see any water at all, I can bring water out of that situation. I just want to focus on a couple of verses, though, from that last lesson. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 4, when they've complained to Moses, he says, he says, Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. So there's two things that are striking that I didn't point out last time. Moses is saying, what am I going to do? Not, Lord, what are you going to do? Uh, so already in his mind, he's thinking that he's got to do everything. Oh, what am I going to do? What I? And that the people are his responsibility and they aren't. They're God's responsibility. There's a person in our life that we think, I've got to train that person. i got to think, no, God's going to do it. Uh, there's a child. Uh, oh, I've got to. I, no, it's God's responsibility. He will tell you what to do if there's something that you're supposed to do. Um, but God is concerned. I was talking with a friend of mine the other day about his son. And I said, God knows this. God's got a plan for your son. I'm, I'm sorry that we always pray in church, Lord, you know, my cousin's out there and they're seeking for you. And we pray it as though God's now taking notes. Like, okay, wait, you had a cousin. I didn't know that. Okay, now tell me about him. What's his name? Where is he? What's it? Okay, now I'm going to go into action. When we pray for somebody, we always pray as though we're informing God of the situation. This is the first time God hearing about it. And now we are activating God in that person's life. When in reality, before that person was born, God already had a plan, was already going to be active in their life. Before we knew there was a problem, God knew it was a problem. Before we were born, God already knew. But we think we're the one that's informing God. And if that person is a, a heathen, if they're an unbeliever, if they're whatever, that our prayers is the only thing that's letting God know what's going on. And, and if, we, if we instead prayed... Lord, you know about the situation. You already know about this, so I'm not worried about it. If there's something that I'm supposed to do, let me know what my part is. If there's something I'm supposed to pray or say, let me know what my part is. But I thank you that you are already involved. That's why the Bible tells us to pray every prayer with thanksgiving. Thanking God for what he's already doing, not assuming that God just now found out. Okay, so when he says, what am I supposed to do with these people? Moses is definitely thinking, they are my responsibility, <laughs> and they are not. So that child, that husband or wife, that boss, that employee, that class, God's responsibility, and he'll let you know what you have to do. So that was Moses' first mistake, and it ultimately ends up being fatal thinking. Then he says, uh, oh, what shall I do with this people? Not my people. Uh, if you recall Moses' his upbringing, although he was an Israelite, he was raised in Pharaoh's household and learned everything Egyptian. When the people looked at him, they saw an Egyptian. He dressed like an Egyptian, spoke like an Egyptian, knew Egyptian languages. But he knew he wasn't Egyptian, so he didn't really belong in that world. When he tried to go to his world and help out, they kind of rejected him, right? Oh, who, who made you a boss over us? And that hurt his feelings so much, he left Egypt for two reasons. One, he had just killed somebody and Pharaoh was going to, he was in trouble. And secondly, his people uh, didn't appreciate his efforts. So he didn't feel connected to them. When he says, what am I going to do with this people? He very seldom calls them his people. 
God's going to have to fix that. God's going to have to change that and teach them empathy for his people. Um, and so there's things that are coming up. We're going to think, wow, why is God saying that? Why? Because Moses is not connected to these people and he, God has to teach him. But he can't make us do anything. He just puts opportunities in front of us to learn. That's what God always does. He just puts an opportunity in front of you. It's like as a teacher, I couldn't make anybody learn. I'm going to get up every day. I'm going to teach. And I, you have the opportunity to go, oh, that's interesting. Let me, or you can go la, 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 and, and, you know, which is fine too. So it's up to you. God puts opportunities and then sees how we, we react. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 5, God answers. The Lord says to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river. Now, this rod, he had done many things. So God's, and he's about to go and strike the, the, the rod. He could have said the rod that you used to part the Red Sea, the rod that you do this or that. But remember when he struck the river and it turned to blood, that was judgment. That was God's first judgment. And um, he says, take the rod with which you struck the river, meaning being that same attitude this is judgment. The striking of the rock and the striking of the river, he's comparing these two things. God is, not me. Take the rod in your hand with which you struck the river, not when you parted the sea. When you got mad at Pharaoh for his unbelief, strike the river, go strike the rock. It was judgment. I'm frustrated, God saying, I'm, I, I need you to demonstrate that this is judgment. And this is very important because the next time God wants him to do something totally different. But he needs to show the people, you're complaining, you're saying, I has brought about us here to kill us, is God with us? Or the, strike the rock in judgment, even though my mercy is going to come out and I'm going to bring the water, the water, let them know that I'm judging them for their attitude. Okay, next, right after this, the so water comes out and they drink. Uh, so there's many lessons God's teaching. As long as the rock is there, I can bring water from the rock. Uh, so I can turn a situation that you think is horrible into something wonderful, right? Just like the bitter water sweet, right? If you see no way, I've got a way. Uh, and that's, he's trying to teach them that. Yes, I brought you to a rock so that, but I was going to have Moses just speak to it. But instead I'm having him strike it because you need to know that this is not a good attitude. You can't just keep doing, coming to me and threatening me and blaming me. Uh, okay, now in, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, it says, Now Amalek came and fought against Israel in Rephidim. So they're in this nice oasis place. Amalek, let's, let's go back and see who Amalek is. Uh, this is the first people to fight them, and that is significant. In Genesis chapter 36, verses 1 through 3, it says, now this is the genealogy of Esau. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob and Esau are twin brothers. The Israelites are all the children of Jacob. But he says, I want you to know who the children of Esau were. So now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Uh, they called him Edom, which means red, because he has red hair. Um, and he's the father of the Edomites. Okay. Esau took his wives from the daughter of Canaan. Now, God had said, do not take a daughter of the wives of Canaan, and Esau's in total rebellion against God. I know God said that, and I don't believe in your God, and I don't believe he's going to do anything, and I don't who you're, so I'm going to go off and marry these Canaanite women, even though they're cursed. And that's kind of Esau thumbing his nose at God, um, and, and Isaac and Abraham and all this mythology he in his mind that's eh, just a bunch of wives tale you guys go to church you believe in all that god stuff eh. okay so he took his wives from the daughters of canaan he took ada the daughter of eli the hittite he took a, a holibama which is a great name i'm sure i'm saying that wrong it looks like a holibama but it's you know holibama or something the daughter of a arad the daughter of zibian the hivite so there's a Hittite and a Hivite, and he took Basimath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. Okay, 
So Ishmael is actually not a Canaanite. Ishmael had married a an Egyptian. Uh, his mother was Egyptian, and and uh, but he took an Ishmaelite as opposed to an Isaacite, right? His dad. So he married his uncles, Ishmael, uh, from their family. Now, uh, now Ada is the first wife that was mentioned. Bore Eliphaz. That's going to be significant. So Esau had a Canaanite wife. They bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Bathmath bore Reuel. Okay, Reuel. Now. Um, then Esau took his wives, and this is verse, I went down to verse six. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle, and all his animals, and all his goods, which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. So even though God said, I'm giving you this land, this land belongs to you. And just because Jacob had gotten his birthright, which means he's going to get an extra portion of that land, he gets one extra portion of the land. Esau didn't want any of it. I'm getting out of this land altogether. So I'm thumbing my nose at your traditions. I don't care if you said you need to marry this and marry that. I don't believe in any of that stuff. And this Canaan land, no. And he took his family and moved away from his brother. He says, because, well, there's just not room enough. So I'm going to go to a totally different land. I supposed to let me go farther up in Canaan in this land he's given us. He went on the other side of the Jordan. Okay, uh, and he went to a country far away from the presence of his brother Jacob. Verse 11, and the sons of Eliphaz were, so Esau has Eliphaz, here's Eliphaz's sons, were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Geham, Kenaz. Now, Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz. So Eliphaz had a wife. So Esau's son had a wife. Which he had five kids, but we also had a concubine, and they call her concubine because it was not married. This was this was not. This is Eliphaz being bad, and Tima was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek. Ah, uh, so Amalek is as far. If you just want to think, I. I don't like God. I don't like his traditions. I don't believe in your God. Uh, my, I'm moving away. My son is going to go ahead and we're going to live in a different country because we don't even believe in God's promises. We don't believe anything about God. And then my son has a wife and then his concubine that he's thinking around with because I really don't care and believe in this marriage thing. And, uh, and their son is Amalek. So Amalek is growing up hearing these stories and just know that by the time the story gets to Amalek, uh, Jacob or the Israelites had kicked his father out and made him leave and and kicked him out of his birthright. So he hates Jacob's family because that's his, his grandfather's brother is a horrible person and his kids are evil and he hates them. And they, they follow that God thing and they believe all that God stuff. And because they believe all that God stuff, they did all this terrible stuff to us. That's where Amalek, Amalek is coming from. 200 years later, Amalek, the children of Amalek have grown and they're mighty. They hear the stories about the children of Israel coming across the Red Sea. They hear the stories. They know what they did to Egypt, uh, in Egypt. And the people of Jericho will tell you, everybody else is afraid. Oh, my God. They somehow defeated the Egyptians. They were the most the mightiest army in that. Amalek's not afraid. Amalek wants to destroy them because Amalek hates them. Not because you're on our territory. They're going to fight with some people because you're on our territory and we're fighting to defend our territory. That makes sense. Uh, somebody just walks in your house. You, you might kick them out of your house. Like, you can't just walk in my house. So it doesn't make you evil. It just means you're defending your territory. Uh, and so as, as the Israelites are going through past the Midianites and the Moabites and all the different people, they think you're, you're, you're going to take our territory from us. Uh, in this case, so it's understandable while they're fighting, they don't necessarily hate the Israelites. Amalek hates the Israelites. Amalek left its place and came and got them for no reason. Because, 
other than I hate you. And so there are people who just hate the things of God and hate us and wanted the these Israelites destroyed from the face of the earth. You can't exist. I hate you that much. Not once you get out of here, uh, I won't think about you anymore. Once I defeat you and you go on your way, then you're out of sight, out of mind. Nope, I'm going to make it my point to try to annihilate you as long as you're here. I hate you that much. And that's who Amalek is. We have Amaleks in our lives that sometimes just have an unholy hate. Um, and there are people who have been trying to destroy the Jewish nation, just trying to eliminate them from the face of the earth. We don't want Jews on the face of the earth. I do not know why. That's just an evilness in their hearts. And they want the people not defeated, not slaves. Uh, Pharaoh wanted the Israelites to stay. Stay and be our slaves. We can use you to build. And Amalek's, no, you can't exist anymore. We're going to pick you off one by one until you're all gone. So Moses says to Joshua, uh, Joshua is, now this is the first time Joshua is mentioned. We've talked about Joshua a bunch, but the scriptures so far, it's Exodus chapter 17 before this guy named Joshua is mentioned. Who's Joshua? Uh, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 6, it says, From the tribe of Judah, Caleb was the son of Jephunneh, and from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea was the son of Nun. Hoshea later became Jehoshua, which is Joshua. We would say Joshua. Uh, so he's from the tribe of Ephraim. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. So you've got these uh, warring people. I mean, Caleb and Joshua, interestingly, I know they, they were both the spies that said, hey, we can take the land. But actually, J uh, Joshua and Caleb were from two tribes that did not like each other, that were competition to each other. Once they got to the other side, the competition got worse and worse and worse. Um, but uh, so Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim. And at that time, if you're from Joseph's line, Ephraim is Joseph's son, right? His, his second son. People kind of revered you because Judah hadn't done anything yet. Yeah, Judah had done things in the eyes of God. Judah had given his life for Benjamin. And, but that's in the eyes of God. God sees the potential in Judah. The people were looking at Joseph. Ooh, he's impressive. He's a king. And, and his kids must be important too. So Joshua... He's got an elevated place. So he turns to Joshua and he says, choose some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Um, so there's, there are times when God wants us to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And there are times he wants us to do something. So I don't ever want to sound like you are never to do anything. You were to ask God, what should I do? That's better than just going off and doing something and not consulting with God. Because you end up with an Ishmael in your life. You're like, oh, God didn't tell you to do that. But it doesn't mean we're never to do anything. It just means wait for God to tell you what to do. That's all. If God doesn't say anything, don't do anything because that will you be messing up. If God doesn't say anything, it's not because God forgot. God doesn't go, oh, 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 oh sorry. I forgot to tell you. God, <laughs> we don't serve that God. If God's not saying anything, don't do anything. But if you go to him and pray... And then you suddenly feel like an urge, like, I think I'm supposed to go talk. Follow that up. So Moses tells Joshua, go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill. So somehow they knew it wasn't going to start till tomorrow. I don't know if Amalek said, word, you got one day to get out of here, or I don't know. Or we're coming back tomorrow, we're going to kill all of you so, he can, so they can just spend the night in fear. But somehow they knew it was not going to happen until tomorrow. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Who is Hur? H-U-R. Ben Hur. Like Ben Hur. Who is Hur? H-U-R. It says Moses, Aaron, and Hur. So we know that Aaron is Moses' older brother, three years older than him. Hur, in Jewish tradition... Her is Miriam's husband. Miriam is Moses' sister. Uh, and so it was Moses' brother-in-law. The rabbis teach. That's the, the, what they have passed down in their tradition. That's who her is. And so I believe that there's things that they know about the Bible since it was written to them, since they were there when it was written, the Jewish people, that they've passed down certain stories 
as an addendum to what we were reading. So that's who they think her is. And it makes sense because it's these three people. There's Moses, his brother, and probably his brother-in-law because her has this exalted position. And everybody else knew who her was. He doesn't even introduce her and says, uh, um, and her, who was the son of blah, 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 he just throws the name in because they all knew who her was. So they go to the top of the hill, the three of them. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel veiled. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Why did God do it that way? Was there something magic in Moses' hand? No. He's teaching them, whenever you are reaching out to me, I'm gonna, you'll prevail over your enemy. Whenever you forget to reach out to me, your enemy's winning. He's giving him a visual sign. There wasn't some magic in Moses' hand when he would, when he would reach, stretch his hand out to God, because they don't, they don't know to do this. They, they haven't had any contact with God in 215 years. So they don't, I mean, that they recognized. God is providing their needs all the time, but they don't know that. They don't think it was God. They think it's Osiris and this God and that God. And they don't know you can, God will help you with that. They don't know these things. So God is teaching them. See, when the enemy comes to attack you, as long as you are focusing on me, calling on me, reaching out to me, you're going to be winning. When you forget to do that and you take it on yourself and you forget to consult with me and you forget to keep your eyes on me, you are losing. You won't lose because I'm going to do something to wake you up and make you get your eyes back on me. Uh, and that's why certain things happen in our lives. Uh, and we go, oh, Lord, help me back. Oh, I'm back. Now your eyes are focused on me again. So you're not going to lose because God will do something to get your attention back on him. But you're losing when you're just taking it upon yourself and you're forgetting that God has a part in your day. So that's on purpose. Uh, in Psalm 28, then they internalize this. Verse one, to, verse 1 and 2. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. And he says, you're my rock. This rock imagery comes from when they were there and God... Moses is hitting the rock or speaking to the rock and water comes from, they say that rock that was there, that was already there, everywhere we went, there was rock. And, and at any time, God could just burst forth of the rock. You are my rock. You're that rock. And, and then Paul says the rock that followed them was Christ, you know. Uh, so God is painting pictures in their head. He says, oh, Lord, you're my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Like, if I don't hear from you, I might as well go down to the pit. So, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. So, when I lift up my hands to you, I know that you hear my voice. When I'm, and it's not like you literally have to stand with your hands up and pray all day. It's the, it's the visual he's giving to them. Keep calling on God. Keep trusting him as things get worse, as... You say, okay, Lord, I'm just trusting you. And then you keep going. You're about to take that test. You're about to go apply. Okay, Lord, I'm here. You know, the person who's interviewed steps out the room for a second. All right, Lord, just, you know, I'm trusting it's going to, like, keep, keep it, your eyes on him. All, <laughs> talking all day long. And you don't have to get down on your knees. You don't have to go to the church. He's everywhere. Just, he's just saying, keep talking to me all day. It'd be, as long as you're talking to me, you're good. As long as you're looking at the enemy. And, and then, you know, he's winning. First Timothy 2, chapter 8 says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Not in anger, not thinking this is not going to work. But Paul, Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, and they still have that image of lift up holy hands. Not, again, you don't literally, I mean, you can. I some often pray with my hands up, but you don't. God's not saying, if, if you don't have your hands up, I can't hear you. It's the idea that you are reaching out to God for help. I look to the hills from which cometh my help, you know, that you have that image of I'm always looking to God. I am not getting mad and just taking it on myself. I'm going to fix this. God's too slow. No, God's not too slow. If you don't see an immediate answer, wait. If he, he, He's about to have you strike a rock. He's about to turn the bitter water sweet. He's got... But don't just, ah, I got to do this. Because that's when we are angry because we're mad because we feel abandoned and God's leaving me all by myself. And then we're the people in, in, in the wilderness who were thinking, what was wrong with them that were complaining? But that's what we do. We complain because we think 
our anger comes from, oh man, it's not working out, and it's I I got to fix this myself, and uh, and then I'm just I'm always abandoned. It's always on me, and it's like, God's like, hello, I'm still here. I'm still here. You don't have to take all that anger on yourself. I I've got you. Uh, in Luke chapter twenty four, verse fifty. It says, Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them, right? He lifted up his, that same energy of that same idea of, I want you to know that this is coming from God. Even Jesus is physically demonstrating to them, all my help comes from above. Uh, not that God is, you know, literally up above. He's all around us. But now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So this is toward the end of his ministry, right? He's already rose, risen from the, from the grave. He's gotten off the cross. He lifts up his hands. He blesses them. And then he just keeps going on up, up into heaven. Uh, so this idea of he wants us to get this image. And they were, when they would look up on the hill and see Moses' hand lifted up, oh, good, it's all going to be okay. And that's what we're supposed to think. As long as I have my eyes on God, it's all going to be okay. Exodus chapter 17, verse 12, verse A. I mean, verse 12. It says, but Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and they put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands. So you've got these three elders. They're, they're, they're lifting his hands. They're helping him. Um, so, uh, again, Hur is somebody important. Uh, I know that in, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 10, it says, verse 13, so Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. So he took the elders of all the tribes, right? There's 12 elders from different tribes. And he says to them, Aaron and Hur, they're over you. So again, that's why people are thinking Hur must have been like his brother-in-law or something because he had this exalted position just like Aaron. And if any man has difficulty, let him go to them. They will advise you. Um... Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Ori, the son of Hur. Oh, so here's one. I'm bringing this up because Hur's grandson is the one who built the tabernacle in the wilderness. Once God says, I've got to teach you to understand my presence. So I want you to create this tabernacle, not a temple. He just showed them how to make this traveling tent thing. Uh, so that my presence can come down so you can be more conscious of my presence because you think when you can't see me that I can't see you. When you walk into the liquor store, you think, it had, oh, God can't see me in here. When you go to the strip club or when we go to the this or go to that, we think, well, God can't see what I'm doing around. God can only see me in church. We do have our church behavior because we think, well, God lives in church. So in church, I'm, but when I get to the parking lot, then I'm really show out because God can't see in the parking lot, I guess. So God says, I need to show up so you can see my visible presence. So you'll know I'm always here. Because when Moses would go away, they'd build a calf, they dick, because they think, well, God can't see us. And we, it's just weird that we, well, that's what happens. So if you teach people that God's only at church, then your kids act crazy when they go to school because you didn't teach them God was in school. You taught him God's just at church. So when we go to church, we act all holy. But, but if you think God's everywhere, don't act differently at church than you do at home anywhere else. Because it teaches the sends the wrong message. Uh, so that's why he had them build a tabernacle so they can see his physical presence. Who built it? Uh, he says, I have called by name Bezali, the son of Uri, the son of Hur. So this is Hur's grandson of the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold and silver and bronze. And, he'll, and he tells everything he's going to build. He's going to build the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle. So he had that kind of skill. So Hur's grandson is the one who God called on to build all of this stuff. Right. So that's, anyway, that's who Hur is. So Abraham, um, Abraham Moses' arms are getting tired, and they support him. They have him go sit down. Nobody told you to stand up the whole time. That's on you. You can sit down. God can, you can pray standing up. You can pray sitting down. You can pray lying in your bed. You don't have to be on your knees. You can be on your knees if you want. But Moses, you made that up. Because God's not like he's tall. I got to stand and, you know, in order for God to see me. Sit down. So he sits down. We'll support your arms. And that is 
symbolic of us supporting other people in prayer, right? We support them. Oh, you're going through something. It can be exhausting when you're going through a situation and you're praying about it and praying about it. And it's nice to have to know that you have some people helping to support you, right? So we support one another. Oh, you're going through that? Okay. Donna, Donna or this person or Tammy or I'm going to support you in prayer. I'm going to support you. That's, 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 you know, just a loving thing to do. So they're supporting him. One on one side, it says, and the other on the other side, and his hands became steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord says to Moses, so, and I want to, we're going to talk about Amalek here for the last, in the last 10 minutes here. Then the Lord says to Moses, write this for memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. So this is the first thing that we have account of that God tells Moses to write down. I want you to write down exactly what happened with Amalek and write down what I'm about to tell you and make sure that Joshua, Joshua hears this and you're reminded of him. That I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So these are people that you're not only going to defeat, but I'm going to blot out their memory from heaven. The Amalek people will no longer exist. And I want to remind them because Amalek can continue to attack you for generations. But do know that eventually they will be blotted out. Why does God not do something instantly? Because he's always giving people the opportunity to repent. But Amalek's, Amalek's atrocities against the children of Israel grow and grow and grow until God has to just blot them out. Otherwise, Amalek is going to destroy the Israelites and Jesus is never born because he's wiped everybody So I can't have these people exist because they're going to try to wipe out all of Israel and The world needs Jesus to be born so I can save the world so because but I'm giving Amalek Amalek's time to repent They're gonna keep losing and losing and losing. Hopefully they'll go. You need to stop attacking those people But instead they double down the people who double down People who you say, that's a horrible thing to say. So they double down. Okay, that's, that's evil <laughs> when you can't be chastised. When somebody says, oh, you shouldn't have done that. And then you just come back even stronger with the evil. That's like real defiance. But that's who Amalek was. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29, it says, When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed uh, to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. So you're going to, I'm sending you back into Canaan. You're going to take their land because these are the Canaanites who the Sodom and Gomorrah people who, the, who are just worshipers of the devil and et cetera, et cetera. Don't follow after their ways. Don't say, ooh, but they had that really neat temple. Or they had that really cool thing that they used to do late at night. Do not. After they've destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will also do likewise. That was really cool. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abomination on the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. So that's part of their ritual. Like their gods in their mind demand the sacrifice of their own children. They will burn their children in the fire to see how strongly they believe. Don't follow after them, even though it looks dramatic and cool. And, and, and the devil can look really like, wow, did you see that? They were all wearing cloaks and they painted their faces black and they were dancing around and twirling and then they would jump on the fire and just, ooh, that's so dramatic. And sometimes they're attracted to the dramatics. Don't do that. In Numbers chapter 24, he says, Verse 14, and now indeed I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. Who's this talking? This is Balaam talking to Balak. And Balak wants the Israelites destroyed. And Balaam's like, no, but I will advise you what's going to happen to your people. And, he begins, and here's what the Israelites are going to do to your people unless you repent. Then he looked on Amalek. This is Balaam. And he took up his oracle and said, Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. And he's just 
prophesied. Amalek was the first nation to attack. And someone gives this image. Like, let's say there's scalding water. And this is how boys think. It's, this is the boy thing. Thank God it's not a girl thing. That's why girls outlive boys. Scalding water. No, Everybody's afraid to touch it. Oh, my God, it's scalding water. One stupid boy is going to put his hand in there. Ah, ow, 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 and get, oh, 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 and take his hand out. Oh, man, that burnt. Who? Well, of course, the next, now the next guy's going to have to try it because something's wrong with boys. Well, I want to stick my hand in there. And the next, oh, now there's two. And it doesn't matter if the hand is burnt and scalding and scarred. Then the next, wise, next person is going to do it. It was scary until that first person did it. And that first person always does something. And they could break their leg. Guys will jump off a cliff. And I don't know. I broke my leg, but I'm okay. Oh, that was fun. Well, don't you know the next guy has to do it? Because something is genetically wrong with boys. So Amalek was the first. Nobody was going to attack the Israelites until Amalek attacked them. And even though they lost, other nations are not coming after them because of Amalek. Uh, but he says they'll be last until they perish, and eventually they'll be taken care of. Deuteronomy 25, verse 17, says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt? And this is when they're just about to. Now, 40 years have passed, and the Israelites are about to go into the promised land. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. So you've got hundreds of thousands of people moving through, right? This tribe of Israel that's moving through. Well, of course, in the back are the elderly because they can't move as fast. Little kids are in the back. People who are weak, who are sick, who are tired. He says, you, that, that's who they are. They picked off the weary and the weak. And you didn't even know because everybody else is way ahead. And these people are not thinking somebody's behind them going to attack them. And so they're slowly, but you would turn around and look and they had attacked the, the, the elderly, the weak, the sick, were killed. And that's how Amalek is. And he's like, I'm going to pick you off one by one. So you remember when they did that and said they didn't fear God. Everybody else was afraid. Ooh, their God is powerful. Amalek says, I hate their God because their God was mean to my granddaddy. And we had to live in a different place. And they had this whole story in their head, Amalek did, about Esau and Jacob. And they hate them and want to eliminate them. He says, therefore, it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land in which your Lord God has given you to possess his inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't be worried about Amalek. I'm eventually going to blot that out. So there could be someone in your life, some enemy, uh, some like there's some stalkers that are bothering one of the people who watch this. God's going to take them. He's going to pick them off. Don't worry, God knows about them. He's going he's gonna to get them, right? He says, I'm going to get Amalek. Not as quick as you want, but I'm going to wipe them out. I'm actually giving them a chance to repent and stop doing what they're doing. But if they stay in the evil, they'll be blotted out. So when did this happen? It started with Samuel. I mean, when Saul became king. So this is literally 200 years later. Saul is king. And Samuel goes to Saul and gives him orders. Samuel said also to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish, punish Amalek for what he did to Israel and how he ambushed him on the way when he came from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them. Kill both man and women, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, donkey. You have to wipe them all out because their children have learned the same thing. Well, two things. If their children haven't learned to fear God, I mean, to hate God, I know this is going to sound crazy, but it is better that they die before they curse God. It's been eternity, because God's always thinking about eternity. So, but, but if they're going to grow up and become those who curse God and hate God and, and, uh, and end up in hell for eternity, then, I, and I know it sounds great, then it's better... You're saving their life because God's just always thinking about eternity. When I was teaching high school, I'm thinking about the 80 years my kids are going to spend out of high school. They're only thinking about high school. They're, they're acting stupid and throwing spit wads and being crazy and not studying for tests because they have no idea this is such a short period of time. I'm trying to prepare you so that you can go to college, get a job, understand what marriage is about, understand what paying bills are about, understand what, all, you know. And you're only focused on this. And God's saying that to us. 
we're, you're focused on this temporary life and eternity is eternity. And, and you're, people are going to spend the eternity in hell or in heaven with God. And, and so whatever I have to do to make sure you spend eternity with me, I'm going to do it. So uh, wipe them all out. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 18, Samuel comes back to Saul to see, did you do it? And he's hearing these bleeding of sheep. Wait, I shouldn't be hearing anything. You're supposed to have destroyed everything. Now, the Lord sent you on a mission, he says to Saul, and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they were consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Like you saved all this, your best stuff. So you're just going to openly defy God. You know I came from God and told you what to do. And you think, eh, God doesn't know what he's talking about. And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I brought him back and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. I, you know, I just let Agag live. But the people took the plunder and the sheep and the oxen and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to the sacrifice to the Lord your God. Instead of destroying them, they said, no, God's wrong. Let's make a sacrifice because, you know, we had to make a sacrifice anyway. Let's just sacrifice their stuff. And then we don't, that way we're not sacrificing our stuff. So, you know, look, we found all these sheep and stuff. Let's go to the temple and sacrifice them and God will be happy. It's like, I don't think so. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You think I, I want the sacrifice? No, I want you to obey me. I don't care. What, you didn't do what I asked you to do. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Heeding what I'm saying, then the fat of, fat of rams doesn't mean anything to me if you're disobedient. For your rebellion as a sin of witchcraft and your stubbornness as a, is as iniquity and idolatry. Why? Because when we do witchcraft, we are conjuring what we want. When, when uh, we, I'm going to have a spell to make this person fall in love with me. I'm going to have a spell to make this person give me their money. I'm gonna, we're trying to control the situation. We're making ourselves God. It says, your stubbornness is like idolatry. When you just do your own thing, and even though God gave you specific instructions, if you don't know what God wants, he's not mad when you say, so I think that's what God wants me to do, and you messed up. Nah. But when somebody shows up and says, here's exactly what you're supposed to do, and you think, eh, I'm not going to do that. Then God is very frustrated and upset. It says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So, 1 Samuel chapter 30, now, a gag is still alive, by the way, during this time period, he gets somebody pregnant during this time period. Um, uh, now, it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. So all the Amalekites were not dead. David, who's later king, he's having to deal with the Amalekites himself. Uh, and they're setting cities on fire because that's what the Amalekites do. They want you dead. And they had taken captive the women and those who were from there, from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So they, he burned all the cities and kidnapped their women and children. When the soldiers came back to their town, their city had been burned down, their wives and children had been kidnapped. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Oh my God, the Amalekites have my children. They're torturing. What the hell are they doing? They burned our homes. They're evil. Uh, this could have been taken care of earlier if Saul had done what he's supposed to do. Second Chronicles chapter 4. These recorded by name in the days of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and they attacked their tents and the Menunites who were found there and utterly destroyed them as it is to this day. So they dwelt in their place because there was pasture for their flocks there. So now Hezekiah, this is 200 years after that. This is around, no, it's about 300 years after that. It's around the 700s. Hezekiah, no, it's about the 800s because uh, Isaiah is about to prophesy. Anyway, so they're still living with the Melchites. And some of them, 500 men of the sons of Simeon, went to Mount Seir, having as their captors, and he names all the people. Uh, and they defeated the rest of the Amalekites who had escaped, and they had dwelt there to this day. So they're still dealing with the Amalekites, still dealing with them. The Amalekites are burning and looting and doing all the horrible things. And uh, they're still dealing with the Amalekites. But God says, don't worry. Eventually, they're all going to be wiped out. Eventually, somebody's going to be totally obedient to what I had to do. Well, in Esther, chapter 3, the all of the... Uh, 
the nation of Israel, of Judah, has been captured and taken off to Babylon. And they're there, even though the temple's being built, the Jews, for the most part, are still living in Babylon. And all of them are still there. And, and Xerxes is king, and he's fallen in love with Esther, who's a Jew. He doesn't know she's Jewish. Haman makes sure that Xerxes finds out that she's Jewish. And he's got a plan. It says, after these things, King Ahasuerus, who's also Xerxes, we even know them as Xerxes, promoted Haman, the son of, Ham of Hamandatha, the, the Agag, the Agag, the Agag, A-G-A-G-I-T-E, Agagite, from King Agag. Remember, Samuel, Saul was supposed to kill King Agag. No, I saved King Agag. And then he has a kid. Then they killed King Agag later, but it's too late. He'd already had a kid during that time period when Solomon was being, I mean, Saul was being so disrespectful to God's word. That's why God snatches the kingdom from him. Sorry, you can't be king anymore. You're a mess. So he's got a kid now, great grandkid whose name is Haman. And he advanced him and set him above all the princes who were with him. This is King Artaxerxes, the Persian king. And he gives him power. And all the king's servants were, with, were within the king's gate, bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage, right? He's not, he's not going to, uh, he's Jewish, like, no, I'm not bowing to Haman. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So Haman is the last living Amalekite, and he's going to destroy all the Jews. And this is the first full Holocaust where, and it came down to like just hours that they were all the Jews would be eliminated from the earth. And again, Amalek, Amalek when God, God sees this way down the road, like, we're going to have to destroy. Please, when I tell you to destroy them all, destroy them all. Because you don't know what they're going to do later. I'm telling you, Mrs. Hitler, don't have that baby. You know, uh, name, and name him Adolf. Because he's going to grow up and destroy all the Jews. You know, So God can see what's going to happen. And sometimes we think, well, I don't have to do everything. I want you to give all that money uh, to that person. Oh, let me say $5. Uh, I want you to... You know, he tells us to do something and we do it halfway because we think, well, why do I have to do the whole thing that God's saying to do? Because you don't see the consequences down the road. So uh, the Amalek God sees the whole story of the Amalekites and how they're going to burn and kidnap and pillage. For generations, they are going to be after you. I'm going to destroy them, but you have to be obedient when I tell you to be obedient. In Exodus, so that's why he says, write this down for Joshua. Next is chapter 17, verse 15, the last verse. And Moses, and Moses built an altar, and he called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So we're building this memorial here, knowing that God's going to be coming after Amalek, coming after Amalek from generation to generation. Moses had no idea. He couldn't see 500 years down in the future all that Amalek was going to do, but he trusted God. And God said, write this down. Amalek's going to be a problem, and I'll be going after them for generations. But when I tell you to go after them, you've got to go after them. Write it down and say it in Joshua's ear so they know to not let Amalek, Amalek off the hook. But they do. Finally, God arranges, as we know, to have Haman destroyed. And the last living Amalekite is taken care of, but not until he almost brought about the total destruction and elimination of the Jewish nation. So, a couple lessons from this chapter, just quickly. As long as we have our hands raised to God, and not literally, we are winning. As long as we are consulting God, listening to God, checking out with God. If he, give, if he says anything, cool. If he doesn't say anything, cool. It doesn't matter whether God speaks to us. It matters that we're speaking to him. So God may not give you an instruction that day because what you're doing is okay. That means what you're doing, you know, your GPS is not going to say turn left until it's time to turn left. So you may not hear from your GPS for 10 miles as you're driving because you're on the right path. 
And then when it's time, you know, that doesn't mean you're lost. Sometimes we check, wait, the GP hasn't said anything in a while because you're doing everything right. So just because we don't hear from God, that means everything's cool. But we're consulting him. Lord, I'm just trusting that you're guiding me today. Trust that you're leading me today. I'm, my ears open to you if you want to say anything. You know, he, but when we're taking our eyes off God and taking it all on our ass, we're losing the battle. We are losing. So, and then the point number two is there are Amaleks that are in our life to destroy us. God is aware of them and he's taking care of them. But when he says you got to eliminate, I want you to stop smoking. Don't sneak some cigarettes and stick them in the toilet thing just in case. Or all that drug permit paraphernalia, you got to get rid of all of it. Or all that this or what. I'm just making stuff up. I don't know. But what a guy may say, all that's got to go. If you save a little, well, let me just save a little bit just in case. That's going to come back to get you because we're being disobedient. And God's not telling us to eliminate something totally out of meanness. <laughs> he knows that that little bit is still dangerous to us. So if he's saying get rid of all of it, we don't want to be like Saul, uh, Saul and go, well, I know you said that, but we want to be totally obedient because that's how we win the war. Okay, so thank you again, those of you who are listening. I'm amazed, like, why would you? But I appreciate it. So thank you so much. And um, I will see you on Wednesday for those Wednesday Bible studies at 7 o'clock, and we're going through the book of John. Okay, thank you, and God bless you.